Welcome to Modern Management of the Older Adult, brought to you by the Institute of Clinical Excellence. Hey everyone, this is Shelby Blankenship with the MMOA division coming to you live. Um, We are going to be discussing um, deep venous thromboembolisms and the new guidelines that have come out. I mean, they're about a year old, but I think they're just a nice um, rehash on what's been coming as far as research and all those kinds of things. Um, Depending on what setting you're in, this can be a little bit more um, something you see more often versus something you just kind of screen. And so we're just going to kind of go through some options of how you would do that and how that could impact your practice. So this article um, came from the Physical Therapy and Rehab Journal. It was published in May of 2022. Um, The title of it is called Role of the PT in Management of Individuals at Risk for or Diagnosed with Venous Thromboembolisms. It's an evidence-based clinical practice guideline. And what's really nice about this one is it includes both upper extremity and lower extremity. In 2016, it was previously just uh, lower extremity. Um, So they didn't give us a bunch of guidelines for upper extremity, which could be a little frustrating, especially if you were in acute care like I was for a while. Um, We didn't really have any parameters um, specifically from um, a physical therapy perspective. It was just like hospital dependent, um, which could be kind of frustrating if you were really trying to mobilize patients and trying to really um, get that uh, type of um, characteristic out there for your team. Um, So this was really nice just to kind of give some feedback on what those parameters were. Um, So just kind of going into what um, we're going to call it a DVT just for simplicity. Uh, sake. But what we want to look at for DVTs is we want to look at um, one, it usually is caused by a vascular stasis. So lack of vascular uh, movement going through, um, there's something's clogging it up for whatever reason. Um, It can also be caused by an endothelial injury. Um, Sometimes you'll see this with um, trauma, whether it's induced by something that happens to them or something that's like surgical And then another one is um, hypercoagulability. So this could be just genetics. This could be the type of medication they're on. Um, It could obviously get very, very complicated, especially have multiple layers of those, like whether they're having surgery and they have a hypercoagulability and all those kinds of things. It can get really funky and it really screws up the coagulation cascade. And it's not just like that immediate coagulation cascade, but it's that five to six weeks after that acute injury. Um, So for one example, like I knew a lady who had sprained her ankle one week and uh, a couple weeks later, she was having a lot of issues with breathing and still having a lot of swelling at the ankle, which isn't like totally abnormal, but the breathing was, and um, she was adopted. So didn't really know her past medical history and ended up having a pulmonary embolism and had to go to the hospital. So Um, it's one of those things like as therapists that we need to be screening for, and we might not always know people's past medical histories. Um, so that's just something we kind of want to keep in mind. So as far as screening goes, um, for upper extremity DVTs, um, things that you want to keep in mind, you want to make sure that first off, you're going to be looking at, are they having swelling, severe pain, cramping is the skin kind of a funky color, um, they're likely to have, um, more of that upper extremity DVT if they've had lack of mobility in that area for a while. So, um, I'm thinking like very acute stroke or, and they're having like flaccidity in that arm or, um, a recent surgery or a recent injury where they're having to keep that arm immobilized. It's usually that really going from doing everything to doing nothing in a very short time period where this can be an issue. And the screening you're going to want to use is called the CONSTANCE criteria. It's C-O-N-S-T-A-N-S. It has a really nice flow chart of kind of going through the different criteria and kind of seeing like what options there are for that patient and what their um, standpoint is of like high likelihood of having a DVT versus low. And that way you can have that conversation with their doctor if you suspect that that's an issue. For lower extremity, it's the WELLS criteria, W-E-L-L-S. Same thing. It has a nice flow chart um, that you can go through. 
Um, and it can be really, really helpful in trying to kind of figure out like what's really going on with that patient. Um, especially with the lower extremities, we're going to be looking at similar things as far as swelling, severe pain, cramping, skin, um, as far as like warmth, and then also that color, like if it's like weirdly pale or blue or red or something just doesn't look right. Um, and it's very concentrated in one area. We definitely want to get that looked at. Um, for both of those, they'll look at either their D-dimer level sometimes if they're looking from a lab perspective, or sometimes they'll do an ultrasound. Sometimes they do both. Um, it just kind of helps to have multiple factors when you're looking at this to make sure that they're not having, you know, um, asymptomatic on one side, but symptomatic on another side. Um, elevated D-dimers can be related to a lot of things. So it doesn't necessarily indicate like for sure that they have a DVT. It's just another step in the process to see if they do. From that standpoint, we want to look at, you know, you have these different screens, but what are some like other risk factors that you should be aware of if it's not, you know, directly like obvious of like, hey, they've got swelling or whatever. Some things that you want to just kind of keep in mind if they have a history of this. Um, these are the people you really want to be screening for, especially if you're in an outpatient or a um, skilled nursing facility or home health where you might not always have like direct access to medical care, like in a hospital or acute care inpatient rehab. First is if they've been standing for over six hours, that tends to be, you know, that like lack of mo um, movement through that blood flow, prolonged sitting, bed rest for two to three hours. We kind of already talked about that loss of mobility. Um, it can be that like over three days, like so, you know, somebody who, you know, had an injury and they've just been staying in bed for three days at home. Um, another one that I see quite frequently is if they had a very recent loss of mobility. So say they had an acute stroke, acute spinal cord injury, um, something that really, really has limited them. Um, that 15 days, that zero to 15 days time period is a very high likelihood of if they're going to have a DVT, that's when they're going to have one. If they are somebody who has um, been a wheelchair user or bed um, in the bed for a long time, like 30 days plus, the likelihood actually goes down, which is kind of interesting. Um, basically, the body just kind of gets used to that lack of mobility. And yes, we still want to mobilize them, but the likelihood of them having that acute DVT goes down. Uh, cancer is a huge one. They're actually, I think it's either four to six or five to seven times more likely, especially if they have active cancer or less than a year from when they were um, deemed uh, cured, um, that they're likely to have that DVT. A lot of it's due to the medications that they're on um, and, you know, just the lots of surgeries, a lot of just intensity that goes to the body and just a lot of like inflammatory just kind of things that are really hard. Um, so just if you see a lot of patients who um, ha either have active cancer or have had cancer in the past, just kind of keep that in mind, especially if it's a, in that more like subacute um, time period. COVID is one. I think a lot of people are kind of more aware of this now. We've kind of seen that pop up a little bit. Um, if they have an inherited protein deficiency, that's one that kind of goes back to that genetics time period. And then if they have any inflammatory or intra-abdominal issues, um, this can be um, like autoimmune, this can be like bowel disease or things like that. Basically like that kind of like lack of motility in certain areas can really kind of screw up the vascular system there and things just aren't flowing the way they should, um, which can definitely cause a DVT in those areas. So say you screened, you looked at risk factors, um, say somebody comes back and um, this would probably be more likely in that acute setting. Um, what interventions are they going to do for these guys? Um, the first line of defense is usually going to be um, some type of pharmaceutical, whether, and there's so many types. We're not going to go through all those, um, especially in acute care, depending on the type of pharmaceutical, depends on the time period they've been taking it and what their um, blood levels are. Um, depends on like, you know, if are they still in that um, like preventative state or are they in that like full trying to like go after that DVT? It kind of depends on the time range of when you're going to see them and when you're going to hold. Um, so I would definitely recommend like looking at this paper and looking that at that with your medical team to decide like what 
makes sense for them and what makes sense for you and to be on the same page. But you definitely don't want to just show this paper into their face and say, hey, my paper said this. So we're going after three hours. And they say, no, we want you going after 24. Like you want to be on the same page um, to make sure that they understand like what your goals are and what um, their goals are to make sure you're all um, on the same uh, place. But as far as upper extremity and lower extremity, sometimes you can't do pharmaceuticals for whatever reason. Um, I definitely had some situations where somebody came in with like a intracerebral hemorrhage. So they had a brain bleed of some sort and they couldn't, and they also had a DVT and it was kind of like, uh, if we put them on more pharmaceuticals to address the DVT, the potential for increasing the brain bleed could go up. And so you kind of have to like play this game, which can be a little bit difficult. And that's where you really need to rely on your medical team and just kind of help figure out like, what is this patient's baseline? Where are they at currently? Can they wait a day? Can they not? From a mobility standpoint, like, are we really jeopardizing, you know, what's going on here? Um, can you do it like without using, you know, especially with upper extremity, like, can we, you know, do things without using their arm or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So making sure you're having that conversation. But with lower extremities, if they can't do pharmaceuticals, sometimes they can do an IVC filter. And it doesn't necessarily get rid of the blood clot. It just kind of prevents it from becoming a PE and basically getting bigger. And eventually um, it kind of creates this like filter um, so that it the body will be taking these pharmaceuticals or it will eventually just break down because of where the filter um, is and just kind of helps it from becoming a bigger problem, um, which isn't always like the best solution, but that's sometimes like what it has to be. Um, because ultimately what we don't want is for these DVDs become a PE. Now, as far as PEs go, this is something we should always keep in mind, especially if we're concerned if somebody's had a DVT in the past, because they're more likely to have another one, and then a PE could be a potential. Um, so dyspnea is one, so that shortness of breath, chest pain, pre-syncope, syncope, and coughing up blood. I can tell you I've seen this in people who are in their 20s all the way up into their 80s and 90s. So as easy as it is to kind of stereotype like who this is going to look like, you don't always know those genetic factors when people are coming in. So really screen, check your vitals always um, to see where they're at and make sure that they're in a good spot and that you've kind of ruled out some of those things. Um, as always, I like to kind of go through a criteria and they have one as well for pulmonary embolisms. It's called the Revised Geneva Clinical Prediction Rule for PE. Um, again, it's all in this journal article. So you can have um, the Wells criteria, you can have the Constance criteria, and you can have the PE one just printed out for your clinic. Um, that way you can kind of have a way to screen that, especially if you're concerned um, based on the risk factors for that patient population or not. Um, as far as just like, what do we do to, you know, once we kind of have somebody like screened and we're just kind of wanting to make sure that they are aware that this could be an issue, we always want to pr uh, promote mobility with any of these patients. Um, sometimes we have to wait for pharmaceuticals to kick in. Sometimes we have to wait for a filter to be placed or um, if they have like a PE or an upper extremity um, DVT, we might have to wait for like an embolectomy or they do like a catheter thrombolysis sometimes. Um, but basically we want to have it treated to a point where we can mobilize because the whole point of sometimes these DVTs occurring is because of lack of mobility. So we don't want to create a compounding effect where they have a DVT, we immobilize them, and then they have another DVT because that can happen. So really promoting mobility regardless of what setting you're in, you know, acute, inpatient rehab, sniff, home health, and outpatient, that can be super, super helpful um, to help prevent these kinds of things. Um, you definitely want, you know, compression garments and like the compression stockings can be helpful with some of these things, but overall mobilizing, um, really getting like that blood flow from the inside out rather than the outside in tends to be the best, but sometimes it's just not doable what, for whatever reason. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind for some of these patients. We definitely don't want to limit them based on, um, their capacity at that time, but we uh, definitely want to promote their capacity as much. So big things here that we want to go after. Screening. So that's Wells criteria. If we're going to be doing lower extremity, 
Constant's criteria for upper extremity and that Geneva clinical prediction for pulmonary embolism. Refer out, obviously, if needed, or have that conversation with your medical team as well. Um, and then kind of see, like, from an anticoagulation standpoint, pharmaceuticals or surgery, um, when you can start mobilizing again, because again, we want to get these people moving. And then as always for any of these patients, regardless of where they're at from a screen risk factors, if you know, this is, could potentially be an issue, we always want to promote mobility, um, and really try to educate them on not only is this to, you know, promote capacity from a functional standpoint, but this also is to prevent a, the likelihood of this happening. So, um, especially with those with cancer, um, history of COVID, any inflammatory autoimmune diseases, um, recent loss of mobility for whatever reason, that 15 day time period tends to be the kicker. Um, we definitely want to promote these things. And, and it also can be great education for not only the patient, but the family members. Um, sometimes it's really nice to, uh, if mobility is just something they just don't care about, like kind of promoting it on like, Hey, this is help prevent further disease and show like the reasoning of like this one being a big one, especially if they've had it before, they can definitely understand like how, um, sucky for lack of a better word that it can be. Um, so that's that as far as DVT, I will post the, um, link to the article so you can print it out, read it. Um, there's lots of detail in there. I definitely recommend reading through. This is just kind of like a very short snapshot of um, what's been uh, updated as far as clinical practice guidelines, including the upper extremity and lower extremity versus just the lower extremity that we had in 2016. As far as MMOA classes go, um, there is a class coming this weekend with Julie Brower in Victor, New York, June 24th and 25th. Um, we have another class coming, Watertown, uh, Connecticut, on July 15th and 16th. If you are wanting to do essential foundations, um, the next class is August 9th. And then if you're wanting to do advanced concepts, it's October 12th. Uh, thank you all so much for listening to me. I This is a topic that um, I used to have to deal with a ton in acute care, and I always try to screen for it, especially in outpatient, to make sure it never becomes an issue for any of our clients. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Definitely check out the article and I hope that y'all have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the MMOA podcast. If you found this helpful, please share with someone that could benefit. And if you're looking for more practical content to help you better serve older adults, head over to www.mmoa.online where you can learn more about our free resources, our community, continuing education courses, and our certification. Once again, that's www.mmoa.online. Thanks for listening.